divorce fueled by greed and hatred. They came to make a police report. She was looking for someone to kill her husband. Oh, he, like, disappeared? Which is like, yeah. Investigators rushed to save a life that's on the line. There was just no margin for it. It was truly life or death. You could tell she was excited and thrilled with what was going on. A woman determined to kill shows investigators how far she is willing to go. That let me know that we are dealing with a truly evil woman. Montgomery County, Texas sits at the northern edge of Houston's massive sprawl. In the south of Montgomery County, you have kind of your metropolitan Houston type suburb areas. North of the county, it's very rural. You have ranch communities. So you have a wide variety of people. It's 5 p.m. on July 21st, 2015, when investigators are called to a remote spot in Montgomery County and uncover a scene unlike any other. It was a uh, county-owned piece of property that was very isolated, had a lot of cover and concealment due to trees and, and, and high grass. Detective Jason Martinez takes in an unsettling scene. I was standing above the body of a dead man in a grave. The grave is a shallow grave. It looked like it was basically dug by hand, by shovels. The body was wearing nothing but a pair of underwear. His hands were bound behind his back. There was an obvious gunshot wound to the head, a close contact entry wound on the right temple. It was like he was executed, and then his body was placed in a hole where no one else could find it. Detective Martinez recognizes the victim. The victim in the grave was Ramon Sosa. Ramon was pretty well known in the community as a local business owner. He started up a boxing gym and he trained young boxers. He was a mentor to people in our community. Investigators and crime scene technicians meticulously process the scene. We took a lot of photos, different angles, start outward, work inward, get up close. Then, in an instant, what looks to be the scene of a cold-blooded murder is transformed. Ramon Sosa, R-A-M-O-N-S-O-S-A. All I can hear is the clicking of the 35 millimeter camera going around me just taking pictures. Not stop. And then that was it. It's okay, Mr. Sosa. You're good. Once we completed taking the photos, we helped Ramon out of the grave. The crime scene is part of an elaborate sting operation. The plan was to stage the murder of Ramon to fake Ramon's death. He was having to pretend to be dead to save his own life. Probably one of the few men that has ever walked out of his own grave alive. July 5th, 2015, 48-year-old Ramon Sosa and his good friend Mundo first walked into the Montgomery County Constable's office. Ramon and his friend Mundo came to make a police report. Mundo tells detectives that a couple of weeks ago, he overheard a bizarre conversation between Ramon's wife, Lulu, and Lulu's teenage daughter at the family-owned gym. 
I walk in on a conversation regarding Mr. Sosa with his suit being played squad with his daughter. With her daughter. With her daughter. Okay, so this is this is your wife. Yeah, we're both through the board basically and going to business school with his wife. Now, what kind of troubles are y'all going through? It was a divorce. She wants everything. Money, life insurance, page of 401k, house, businesses, you know. Was at the gym this one evening and he walked in front of my office in the gym and Lulu was talking to her daughter. Mundo explains the subject of their conversation came as a shock. They were talking about that Lulu wished that Ramon was dead. Lulu was looking for someone to kill her husband. Mundo decided to take it upon himself and approach Lulu and ask her what's going on. That's why he started talking with Lulu in order to make sure or see like anybody would want to know, does she really want this to happen? She was a little vague in what she was asking for. She said she wanted him to disappear. I was like, well, what do you mean? Like, this girl in jail? Like, no, you know, disappear. Mundo wanted to confirm and verify what she was talking about made the motion with his hand as though he was holding a gun. Oh, like, like disappear? And she was like, yeah. But I was like, you know what, she's serious. Mundo says in another twist he didn't see coming, Lulu asked for his help. Mundo had kind of a checkered past. He had been involved in a gang, and Lulu tried to enlist Mundo, knowing his history, to see if he knew anyone that could do what she wanted. Thinking on his feet, Mundo went along with Lulu's request. Mundo told Lulu that he had someone by the name of Paco that could do the job, but in fact, Paco didn't exist. He was very close with Ramon. He was concerned something was gonna happen, and so that's why he got involved. Following the conversation with Lulu, Mundo tells investigators he called Ramon. I remember I get a call from Mundo, and uh, he tells me, hey, uh, hey, Pops, you know, this lady wants to kill you. And I said, what are you talking about? I was so upset. So, I mean, there was so much rage, and I was so mad. I can't, I can't believe I, I thought he was joking. I said, no, man, this is not a joke. It's for real. He said, I've seen that look on people's eyes when they want to kill somebody, and she has that look. Ramon tells investigators he was in shock. With the divorce pending, he and Lulu were still sharing a home. She decided she was going to live on the second floor, and I was going to live on the first floor of the house. I just went in the house, went in my room, and locked the door. You know, I just, I just laid in my bed, staring at the, staring at the ceiling, thinking, like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Sleeping, basically, when I open. Ramon and Mundo tell investigators they agreed that their best bet was for Mundo to keep stringing Lulu along. She might be saying this kind of stuff because she's just being mad right now. There's really no evidence right now, so I told Mundo, get as much information as you can. In an attempt to see just how serious Lulu was, Mundo quickly took the next step and told Lulu he'd spoken with Paco, who was on board for the job. She believed him. There was no hesitation. There was no worry on her part. She trusted Mundo completely. Ramon tells investigators he then purchased a burner phone, which he used to text Mundo, posing as Paco, his own would-be killer. He texted back and forth with me, like I was the hitman. You know, I need $200, and let's go do this. Mundo says he showed the texts to Lulu as proof. She had no idea the whole time that hitman was me. I was playing my own hitman. Well, let me ask you this. Uh-huh. Why, did, why did you get involved? Why did you take an extra step to create this fictitious journal? Uh-huh. I was afraid to, that they might get that person to actually do the job. Was Mundo the only person that Lulu was talking to? Was he the only one she was seeking this type of assistance from? 
As the two men continue with their story, they reveal an even more concerning detail. I told her, all right, they want $4,000. She was, what if I give them a truck? A truck and $2,000 later. And so once it starts to, to, start to hit off, they want $100 for me for them to buy the truck. She gave me the $100. And she said, I'm driving forward. I gave them just the $100 right there. There's money involved. She's really serious about having her mom killed. Investigators are stunned by how much information Mundo was able to obtain. Time was of the essence, and this was a very serious matter, so the ball got to move quick. Coming up, investigators dig into the broken marriage that threatens Ramon's life. She started getting really, really jealous. Her whole attitude changed. She just wasn't the same person. And a deadly plot is uncovered. Mundo was recording everything. It was chilling to listen to how she wanted him dead. July 5th, 2015. Texas gym owner Ramon Sosa and his friend Mundo have just detailed to Montgomery County investigators a shocking murder-for-hire plot that has been coming to a head over the past two weeks. They also presented some audio recordings of Lulu speaking with Mundo. Ramon and Mundo hand over cell phones containing text messages from Lulu as well as a thumb drive. Well, long as it is, it's on a case like this, so we're going to take this one. We're going to take that thumb drop. I really need to, to dig into this. I'm going to need to, uh, obviously, get a translator. Okay. Translate what's on the, the thumb drive. As investigators hand off the phones and the drive to be translated, they request Ramon fill in the blanks on his background. Born in Puerto Rico in 1967, Ramon came to the United States with his family in the early 70s, where after several years of moving around, they eventually settled in Texas. We moved to Texas when I was a young teenager, 12 or 13, somewhere around there. There's four of us, siblings. We were very close, all of us are very close. My parents always did a lot of things with us when we were younger. From an early age, Ramon discovered a lifelong passion. I really got the, you know, interested in boxing when my father took me to the gym with him. He fell in love with the sport uh, and never looked back. I turned pro, so I was a professional boxer at 17, still a senior in high school. And that was pretty cool, you know. But soon after he graduated high school, Ramon's path to a professional career was derailed. I just was not training the way I was supposed to be training. And then my father sent me to Puerto Rico to fight over there. And when I came back, my mind was not there with boxing anymore. Barely in his 20s and with one career already behind him, Ramon was looking at the long term when he embarked on his new profession as a driver for FedEx. From there, I moved to L.A. for a job opportunity. And that's where I met the mother of my kids, Dolores. The way I met her was dancing. We got together, and one thing led to another. We, and she ended up getting pregnant with her, my oldest son. And that's when I talked to Dolores and took her back to Texas with me. They then shortly after had my brother, Chris. And then I came. I came along. <laughs> We had a nice home, and I was able to build a pool in the backyard, like, like a little paradise. The kids loved it. After a decade together, Ramon and Dolores parted ways. It's a common law, you know, marriage that what we had. I think we kind of started growing apart a little bit because I didn't want her to work. I was more of a old school, you know. And I kind of, I guess, bothered her a little bit. We got joint custody, and we ended up living separate lives. 
During the breakup, Ramon leaned heavily on his love of boxing. Uh, I still kept going to the gym and did more training young, you know, young fighters. In 2004, he founded an outreach program for kids in the community. It was a nonprofit called Young Prospects Boxing. We would pick them up after school, take them to the gym, and they would train, and kids loved it. In the early days of the program, Ramon first met Mundo. Mundo, one day, came to the, to the gym. He wanted to uh, join a boxing team or club. I told him, you know, if you want to, you can start today. Ramon says Mundo never looked back. In like three months, we came very, very close. And he kind of opened up a little more to me about his background. He grew up as a gang member. Um, it's tough. He ended up going to prison for a little while. He just w went down the wrong path. Then he, when he came out in a prison, he decided to change his life. Working as a delivery driver during the day and training at night kept 40-year-old Ramon Sosa busy, but he still managed to find time for romance. My dad and Lulu met at a nightclub. He saw her across the way and thought she was beautiful. And when she walked past him, she stepped on his foot. She did that and apologized. That was his gateway. I just looked up at her and all I can say is like, would you dance with me? And she goes, of course. And the rest was history. After about a year and a half of uh, dating, I just decided that, you know, this is the one. Lulu Durantes was born in 1974 in Mexico City. She was a middle child of three. She grew up with her mother only. They were very tight in their family. She was working at a Ford uh, factory in Mexico City. And that's when she met her then husband and the father of her kids. Lulu and her husband eventually divorced and she looked for a fresh start in Texas in the mid-2000s. She was here on a visa, visitor visa. She had an apartment where she lived with her uh, two children and her mother. She was working, cleaning houses. She's a hard worker. She's doing whatever it takes to help her kids. After dating for a couple of years, Lulu and Ramon tied the knot in 2009. You know, she loved my dad. My dad was happy. They were happy. She supported my boxing. She becomes an American citizen. It was wonderful. One year later, the family moved across town, and together, Lulu and Ramon opened Woodlands Boxing and Fitness. I was the head coach, and I would take care of the gym, the boxing part of it, and then she did the business side of it. Mundo, he became a right-hand man eventually. Lulu thought that Mundo was a bad influence, you know, ex-con, whatever, and she thought he made the gym look bad, but then... When he started helping and taking care of the gym and, and she found out how to get benefits out of him, now he was good. Over the next few years, Ramon and Lulu focused on running the gym, but the couple's marriage soon began to suffer. We were okay at the first three years, and then after the third year, that's when I saw little cracks starting in our relationship. It seemed like the more money we made, the more arguments we got into. I was working a lot, you know, literally basically all day. Oh, she could say, like, you know, you're always busy with boxing. She started getting really, really jealous about my kids. She would treat them totally the opposite of how she treated them when she met them. And I felt like now that she had a, a nice home, she had money, and her whole attitude changed. Uh, you know, she just wasn't the same person. In 2015, their relationship came to a breaking point when Lulu surprised Ramon by filing for divorce. They had the pickup truck and a couple of cars, I think a couple of motorcycles too. And um, she basically was out to get whatever she could. It was a very difficult divorce. Money, the need of money, that's all it was. 
For investigators, the more Ramon reveals, the more Lulu's motive begins to crystallize. What do you think the, the, more, the motivation of this? Is it anger or greed? Mundo and Ramon leave the office, but not without specific instructions on what to do next. Ramon was advised to limit his interaction with Lulu for obvious reasons um, and to distance himself, but go to work maintain your normal routine just limit your time and interaction with her i ended up staying with my parents they had no idea what was going on i didn't tell anybody i was in constant fear it was horrible living day to day knowing that somebody wants to kill you and you don't know when or where or how coming up Investigators speculate if there are two sides to this sordid tale. She had previously made 911 calls, accused Ramon of, of, of assaulting her. And Lulu puts her plan into action. Detectives in Montgomery County, Texas, are investigating a claim by former boxer Ramon Sosa, stating his wife Lulu is trying to kill him. This case was revolving around a person's life, so we couldn't get it wrong. There was just no margin for error because it was truly life or death. On July 6th, they listened to the recorded phone calls between Lulu and Mundo from the past week. And they quickly discover Lulu isn't shy when it comes to her motive. Ramon worked for FedEx for over 30 years and continued to work for them. And he had a very large pension that Lulu would get um, if he were murdered. As investigators keep listening, they learn that Lulu has a looming deadline. Our finalization of the divorce is coming up soon. And she wanted the hit to happen before then, because if it happened after the divorce, my kids would get all my inheritance. With the deadline less than three weeks away, investigators look closer at the Sosa marriage. As part of a criminal investigation, it, it's standard practice to run a criminal history check on everyone involved. The call history for their residence was pulled. And there did show to be several disturbance calls to the house. She'd accused Ramon of, of, of assaulting her, sexually assaulting her. Lulu called the police multiple times about that. Investigators dig into Lulu's allegations from 2013 and find no evidence to back up her claims. Lulu had called law enforcement several times. They were summoned to the home. I think after the third time the constables came out, they began to believe that this woman was not genuine in what she was telling them. The sexual assault allegation by Lulu against Ramon, that case was fully investigated. Ramon even took a lie detector test during it. The grand jury in Montgomery County refused to indict. And they found there was no probable cause that, that it happened. Finding no reason to discredit Ramon, and with the clock ticking, detectives consult with the district attorney's office. In order to charge someone with solicitation of capital murder, you have to develop your own investigation and our own evidence. Then we decided to do an undercover operation. 
At that point, the sheriff's office took it very seriously and got in touch with the Texas Department of Public Safety. And the DPS sent down uh, an undercover officer posing as assassin. Mundo told Lulu that he had someone by the name of Paco that could do the job that she wanted to do. Law enforcement was able to set up an undercover to assume the role of Paco. The next step was a face-to-face -face meeting with Paco and Lulu. I told them, I said, look, you know, Lulu, she just only have a conversation with, with Mundo. So if anything, I need to have Mundo around meeting with the undercover officer. Mundo agrees to facilitate the meeting between Lulu and the undercover agent. The goal was to have Mundo ride with Paco up to the location to meet with Lulu and then have Mundo introduce Lulu to Paco. And once that took place, we wanted him to get back in his car and leave because we didn't want him involved. On the evening of July 20th, Mundo, Lulu, and the undercover agent meet in the parking lot of a local department store. There were a number of undercover officers that were in the area watching and ready to act in case something went down. Normally when you're dealing with solicitation of capital murder cases, your suspect, they may be a little more nervous. And Lulu Soso was not that at all. Lulu reiterates that she needs the hit to take place within the next 48 hours. Lulu agrees to give Paco an additional $500 up front with more to come after the murder. They agreed on $1,000 cash, the title to Ramon's truck once the job was done, and she was going to give Paco some of Ramon's jewelry to compensate him further. I was pretty taken back. That let me know that we're dealing with a truly evil woman. Following the meeting, investigators take the recordings to prosecutors. While damning, they worry it still isn't enough. In this case, Lulu had no prior criminal history. She was a productive member of society. So there, there were several things in her favor that we wanted to negate the jury from falling for. To seal Lulu's fate, they will need Ramon's help in carrying out an unorthodox plot. On July 21st, 2015, Ramon reports to the constable's office. When you're talking about a solicitation of capital murder case, you want to be able to show a jury or a judge what the suspect will do when they see the person that they wanted dead actually dead and so it's not uncommon to during the investigation to try to stage the murder we knew one of the final pieces of the puzzle was the proof of death the district attorney wanted a certain bar to be met evidentiary wise and we knew that that was going to be staging ramon's death showing proof of death to lulu and getting her reaction on video he said, so what I'm going to do is uh, uh, I'm going to take a picture, show her a picture of you dead with a bullet wound on the side of your head. And I'm like, you're kidding me. I can't, I can't believe it. I didn't know what to say. I was, <laughs> I was stunned. I was in total fear. You know, just didn't know what to expect. 
We had the investigators basically use makeup to place a bullet hole on his head. We made a close contact entry wound on the right temple, what appeared to be a fatal gunshot wound to the head. We collaboratively discussed, you know, hey, do, do we have this right? You know, is, is the stippling just right? You know, this undercover operation had to be spot on, um, had to look legit because ultimately a man's life depended on it. Coming up, will Lulu buy in to the sting operation? We had to put Ramon into hiding. July 21st, 2015. Authorities in Montgomery County, Texas, are acting fast to save Ramon Sosa's life. With less than 24 hours before Lulu's deadline to have Ramon killed, investigators prepare to stage his murder. About 3 p.m. is when we took Mr. Sosa to the gravesite that we used. It was very isolated. I'll never forget. I was sitting in the back of this SUV and it was black valve, you know, and, and we sitting in the back seat thinking like, what am I doing? There were people there already waiting and there was a guy with a, with a, with a camera. And so one of these officers told me how I was gonna pose and all this. They already had a, a shallow grave dug up. Ramon carefully steps down into the four by four foot grave. I instructed Ramon to uh, just put his hands behind his back. That way it appeared as though they were tied behind his back and he was dumped in a hole. And so when I closed my eyes, it added more blood to my nose, I think mouth also. We took pictures of him um, with our cell phones. We had to be taken in a way to look like it was people who had just committed a murder, taking a photograph of someone. When Ramon climbs out of the grave, he is visibly shaken. He was upset, um, like anybody would, seeing basically what is their own death. I knew that was going to be difficult. So many different thoughts were going through my head. I was thinking about my kids and my family. What are they going to say when, when they see this picture of me? I mean, they're going to see it sooner or later. To keep Ramon safe, investigators whisk him away to a hotel at an undisclosed location. The goal of that was to have Ramon's friends reach out to Lulu and to ask where Ramon was, to see what her reaction would be, what her story would be. We had to put Ramon into hiding for several days. They took my phone away. I had no contact with anybody, not his employer, no family members, nobody. And he had to understand that that was the only key to making this work. The officer, you know, when they dropped me out, they said, well, we'll call you as soon as we arrest her. I remember that I just wanted this to be over. On July 22nd, Paco and Lulu meet for a second time. Lulu got in the car. You could tell she was excited and thrilled with what was going on. Probably the most chilling part of this entire case was her immediate response to 
the photo and it was her smile. We had enough. We had our case. We'd gotten across the goal line. The next day, on July 23rd, Detective Martinez and a patrol officer approach Lulu at the gym. Okay, um, Detective Martinez with the constable's office. I had a few questions for you. Lulu was in the back office of the boxing gym. Her mom was there. Her daughter was there. Ramon had been off the grid for the previous 48 hours. Our plan was to speak to her under the guise of me investigating a missing persons report. Apparently, Mr. Sozo hasn't been at work today. I haven't seen him. I haven't talked to him. We're going to divorce. I just let her talk. It was a, about a 10 minute long production of her attempting to give the appearance that she was being helpful to us. But uh, it, it got to a point where I made the decision to, to go ahead and place her in custody. Okay, Ms. Sosa, stand up, please. You're under arrest. Okay, you're, you're under arrest. Ma'am, it's okay. Stay back. We have a warrant. As soon as Lulu is in cuffs, investigators make an important phone call. Give me a call saying, you know, she's been arrested. We're going to go pick you up now. And uh, I've had tears of sadness, of anger, and so many emotions came through me about everything that had gone down. At the station, Police read Lulu her rights, but she refuses to talk. From the minute she was taken into custody, she lawyered up and exercised her Fifth Amendment right. Coming up, the Sosa family hopes for closure. I remember her when they brought her in, the sounds of the chains, you know, her walking. She never looked at me the whole time. I just wanted to be over. July 23, 2015, Lulu Sosa is arrested for solicitation of capital murder after hiring an undercover agent to kill her husband, Ramon. During the sting, Ramon hid out in a hotel. But news of Lulu's arrest breaks before he has the chance to reach out to his family. Hello, everyone. I'm Ashley Van. To this primetime justice, divorce can get messy. My mom, she saw there was a breaking news from Montgomery County next to the Woodlands. The woman tried to murder her husband. My mom's English is kind of broken, and the, the only thing she understood was that she was arrested for killing her husband. She saw her picture on the breaking news, and my mom just fainted and just started screaming. first person I call is my mother and oh my goodness I heard her in the background because my dad picked up the phone and yeah, I hear in the background my mom just yelling you know that kind of cry you hear at funerals just just it, it, it was breaking me and she thought that, that I was dead immediately Ramon rushes to his family's side I get to the house and my dad is there. Eyes are bloodshot. My mom is in the back, just couldn't catch a breath. You know what I mean? And I started calling my sons because everybody was, you know, so many people were there seeing it on TV. I called my sons and my daughter, Mia. I just immediately started bawling my eyes out. I was crying. 
And I remember I just, I was so angry because how could somebody want to kill my father? You know, let alone his wife. While awaiting trial, Lulu never offers up an explanation for her actions, and the couple's divorce is finalized. The divorce, you know, she, everything was awarded, everything, the cars, the house, the gems, was all awarded to me. So out of all that greed that she wanted everything, she went and her kids and her family and her mom without nothing. By the fall of 2016, over a year after Lulu's arrest, she sees the writing on the wall. On October 11th, Lulu takes a plea. She agreed to plead to 20 years in prison to this, what's called what's a second degree felony, which carries a range of punishment from, for her for probation to 20 years. So she accepted the maximum punishment for that crime because um, no one was murdered. Um, her lack of any criminal history in her past and the fact that she was willing to accept responsibility, I believe 20 years is a just sentence in this case. I just was ready to be over with. You know, it was about 15 months later. I just wanted to be over. At her hearing, the judge gives Ramon a chance to speak to his wife and would-be killer. I remember her when they brought her in, the sounds of the chains, you know, her, her walking. And I feel, I feel saddened to see this lady, how she ended up somebody that came to this country looking for a better life for herself and her kids. Ramon was able to give what we call a victim impact statement about the impact that, that this has had on him and what she's done to him and his family. I forgave her and it was as if I had released all that anger and all that air in the balloon and I was at peace again. She never looked at me the whole time and they just took her away. And that's the last time I saw her. But the Sosa family walks away from the ordeal with something far more valuable than money or possessions. Our family is much, much closer. The dynamics between my father and I has been amazing. I mean, I have a four-year-old son, his grandson, his first grandson. He's an amazing grandfather. Um, I know that there's a day that's going to come in your future that, that, that Lulu's going to be released from prison. I hope that she betters her life. What's helped me a lot, too, is talking to people, men and women, that are going through difficult situations in marriages. I hope that people that see my story can learn something from it. And I hope that, is, that it helps you.
February 16, 2014. It's a quiet Sunday morning in Sonora, California, a former gold rush town at the base of the Sierra Nevada mountains. Sonora is in the foothills. It's a slower pace of life. You can kind of go back a hundred years almost. Um, it's not like city living. Just after 11 a.m., married couple Buddy and Casey Thompson pull into the parking lot of Ricky Roberts' U2 Auto Shop. They have stopped by the garage run by their friend, 49-year-old Rick Roberts, to drop off an ATV they paid to be stored there. Ricky was very good friends with one of my best friends growing up, so we kind of got to know each other more on a friendlier basis. Ricky communicated with my husband, hey, I'm getting ready for church. Um, go ahead and, and park in front of the shop if I'm not there. We pulled into the shop and it was quiet. My husband said, hey, wait in the car. I'm going to go see if he's even here. My husband leaned in and then came out of the doorway and this look on his face. He was pale and just in shock and he said you need to go in there a former first responder casey races to the door i saw him laying there he definitely had lost the color and he wasn't moving and then i observed a single gunshot wound to the chest there was blood underneath him i could tell without even touching him that he had passed. Casey and Buddy exit the shop. She calls 911. When the first responders get to the scene, they find the victim's body on the floor inside. They check the pulse. It was obvious to them that he was deceased. Ricky Roberts had two wounds. The grazing wound to the left shoulder, also a wound to the center of the chest. Sonora police officers call for backup from the California Department of Justice. They taped off the perimeter of the shop. Nobody was allowed to go in. Meanwhile, Buddy and Casey struggle to grasp how their Sunday morning took such a dark turn. Ricky was well-respected and well-loved. The kind of person that everybody got along with. So this was just absolutely, like, mind-blowing. What the hell happened here? Why? How? You're trying to make sense of it. Born on January 2nd, 1965, Rick Roberts grew up in Sonora. Ricky had one sister and three brothers. Ricky and his mother were really close. Um, Ricky was a uh, mama's boy. She was a single mom for most of her life and just raised the kids herself. Very Christian-oriented, very strict. Ricky was very close to his mother. She liked him the best out of everybody. He had a few brothers and one sister, but Rick was the golden child. He liked to go to his church with uh, his mom and always be there you know, for his mom. Following high school, Rick opted to join the workforce. He started doing security work at a pretty young age. He was a man of integrity, and security work just seemed like a natural way for him to make a living. With his career path decided, Rick found a hobby that would quickly become a passion. Cars. He had a family member who said, hey, you have a lot of energy. You're creative. Let's do this, and we're going to go work on cars. Rick loved to fix cars, but even more, he loved to wreck them. Rick took on, started to learn how to do destruction derbies. Ricky was my uncle, father figure, and... We did destruction derbies together and worked with each other a lot. The destruction derby is where you get a bunch of old cars and you make them as strong as you can. 
The cars would bash into each other. Last one standing typically would be the one to move on. My uncle Ricky loved it. He wanted to make sure that he made the best of it. In Sonora, Derby was more than a sport. It was a way of life. And Rick Roberts had a reputation. He was well known all over the surrounding counties for being the Derby King. To support his hobby, Rick rented a garage space in Sonora that he dubbed Ricky Roberts U2 Auto Body. Rick, he just liked the whole process of getting a car, get it, haul it to his place, and then start stripping it out. In 1990, 25-year-old Rick had a chance encounter at a local bar that led him into a whirlwind romance. When he met his wife, there was a connection there and that she made him feel um, safe and appreciated. They were like the biggest lovebirds you'd ever see. And she stood right by him through all the derby stuff. In July 1990, they married. They got married up on top of the derby car. It was adorable, unique, absolutely unique. And it was great. They were very happy. After their wedding, the couple began building a life together. By the mid-2000s, they had added a new member to the family. They had adopted their son, and it was something that they found to be one of the best things that they had done. The child came into the picture. You saw a transformation in Ricky. He was just head or heels for this little boy. By 2014, Rick was now in his 40s and focused on family and faith. He was devoted to his church and bringing the community together. Um, Ricky loved being part of that and just being happy to be among friends and family. But Rick's happy family life is abruptly halted when on February 16th, 2014, the Derby King is found dead on the floor of his auto body shop. When homicide investigators arrive, a crowd is already gathering outside Rick's garage. Buddy called me and told me what was going on. We all crowded around, friends, family, everybody, and we were all in shock of what happened. Rick's wife came to the shop when the police presence became known, she was distraught, absolutely distraught, emotional, in shock. She was adamant about seeing him before they had removed him. Amid the chaos, a neighbor steps forward to speak with investigators. Crystal Wise did report that she'd heard what sounded like gunshots around, you know, this 10.20 to 10.30 a.m. time frame. Buddy and Casey had called 911 shortly after 11 o'clock. Investigators must determine if the pair missed the killer by minutes or if there is more to their story. To find out, Buddy and Casey are escorted to the station for more questioning while authorities get their first look at the crime scene. There were no signs of forced entry. The door was open. They found his phone. They found his wallet. It had money in it. All of his credit cards were present. We quickly ruled out that this was any sort of robbery. The blood looked still fresh. And so they knew there was a smaller time window involved. Coming up. Investigators press Rick's friends for answers. When investigation begins, everyone's a suspect. And they uncover unsettling details about his life. He was entertaining other relationships. When there's infidelity in marriage, that opens up all kinds of possibilities and motive. Sonora, California, are called to the brutal murder scene of 49-year-old Rick Roberts. 
this is a small town, to have a homicide is shocking. Rick's friends, Buddy and Casey Thompson, who were the ones to find Rick, are on scene. The couple is en route to the station to give their statements. However, Rick's wife begs for more time. They did not attempt to interview Rick's wife in any sort of sensitive way that day because she was really overcome with emotion. She agreed to be interviewed later, but her focus that day was on their son, who was quite young. Investigators then make their way back inside the shop to get a closer look at the crime scene. Rick was laying sort of on his back in the shop, on the floor of his shop, with a large pool of blood around his body. There was a gunshot wound to the victim's chest, a grazing wound to the left shoulder. Investigators are unable to locate a weapon, but they do find another potentially important clue. What they located very close to Rick's body was a shell casing. The casing belonged to a 9mm handgun. It was a semi-automatic. There were two gunshot wounds discovered on the victim's body. However, there was only one expended casing. So the possibility was that whoever had fired the gun ran out of time and quickly just took off, leaving the one casing. Authorities bag up the shell for testing. Outside, they come across another clue. So there were footprints on the scene. They uh, compared tracks to Rick's boots that Rick was wearing at the time. They also knew what Buddy Taylor and Casey's footprints were and where they had parked and entered the shop. In fact, this was a smaller footprint from, you know, not likely a male. It also had a real distinctive boot type tread on it. They measured it and they photographed it, so we knew the size of it, we knew the tread of it. As they wrap up at the crime scene, investigators consider possible theories. Once you rule out robbery, this was something possibly a little bit more personal. At the station, detectives speak with Casey and Buddy Thompson separately. But their stories remain the same. When an investigation begins, everyone's a suspect. But they were very, very cooperative. Everything they were telling investigators really had matched up, and they could eliminate them. But investigators aren't letting them go just yet. They press the Thompsons for information about who might have wanted to harm Rick. The questioning got a little bit more specific as to who did he hang out with, how's his relationship with his wife. Casey admits that she has noticed tension in Rick's marriage. For a couple months prior to his death. I was just picking up on the cues of the breakdown of communication. There's a problem in the whole thing. While she doesn't know exactly why there's tension between Rick and his wife, she's heard rumors. She wasn't around the shop very often. That uh, myself and everybody knew that there was some marital stress that's going on. He was entertaining other relationships. When there's infidelity in marriage, that opens up all kinds of possibilities and motive. The following day, Rick's wife agrees to come in for an interview. She confirms that there is some truth to the rumors. She was aware that there had been infidelity and they were working on that. Rick assured her it was over. Rick's wife says she doesn't know the names of any women her husband was associated with. When asked for her whereabouts the morning of the murder, she says she was at home with their nine-year-old son. She'd been home all morning with their son, and then he confirmed that his mom had been with him all morning and hadn't left the home. Following the interview, investigators return Rick's personal belongings to his wife. They gave her Rick's wallet and, and I think some keys and things to the shop. 
Rick's wife appears to have a solid alibi, forcing investigators to dive deeper into Rick's private life. They turn to the tight-knit community of Sonora for help. Now you're going to start looking to talk to Ricky's friends. Anybody that might have information. Friends tell detectives that Rick had a lucrative side gig. Ricky Roberts was dealing in scrap metal. But this scrap metal, what makes it unique is that it's worth money. He would take a lot of scrap metal to these huge recycling centers and get paid. You're talking a lot of money. Sometimes there's nefarious people that work in this type of a business. And so you want to look into that. The investigators interviewed the workers there to see, hey, did you ever see Rick have any kind of, you know, confrontation with anybody? Was there any problems? But the promising lead quickly becomes a dead end. Rick was well known down there. Nobody knew of any sort of, you know, confrontations that Rick had had with anybody. So those leads really didn't go anywhere. Investigators are stumped until suddenly Rick's wife shows back up and hands them a lead. During the investigation, Rick's wife brought us a photograph that she'd located in Rick's wallet. She identified the photograph as her husband and her son. But it's the handwritten inscription on the back that gets their attention. The handwriting said, my husband Rick and his son, but the son's name was misspelled, and she didn't recognize the handwriting. This isn't her writing. Somebody else is saying that Ricky Roberts was their husband. Coming up, the mysterious inscription reveals a hidden life. She was at the grocery store, and she just felt that somebody was staring at her. An unsettling obsession takes center stage. He had told her he wanted her to stop following him. store and she just felt that somebody was staring at her this woman had like a cowboy hat on and was dressed all you know really western it was super um creepy and she got in her car and the woman followed them this vehicle followed her all the way up until she got close to her home and then it veered off she immediately told rick about it and rick said oh i'll take care of it i know who it is he initially brushed it off as some woman that's kind of obsessed with me. So then she brought it to Rick's attention and he assured her it was over. With this unnerving revelation, investigators make discovering the mystery woman's identity their top priority. They head to the place where Rick spent even more time than he did at the garage, his church. Detectives go to the church and they started interviewing the pastor and members of the church. When asked for information about Ricky, longtime member Susan Hume tells them about a woman who started coming to church around three years ago. Cheryl Lucero. Sue tried to befriend Cheryl uh, because she knew Cheryl was a new member. So they tried to make her feel welcome. However, Susan says that she immediately noticed that Cheryl's eyes were rarely on the pulpit. 
Susan observed her looking all the time, staring at Ricky and the church. Cheryl told Susan that she recently moved from Modesto and worked as a manager at a fast food restaurant. To earn extra cash, she also accepted a job clearing brush. At that time, Cheryl had an apartment in Sonora. My husband, Joe, had hired her to help with some work around our property. Cheryl was kind of difficult to know. You had to pull things out of her. Cheryl's mother, I believe, lived in Nevada and her father in Modesto. I knew that she had a daughter and a son that lived in another state. She was very quiet, very quiet. In contrast to her quiet nature, the way 45-year-old Cheryl dressed made her hard to miss. Cheryl loved to dress in cowboy gear to look like what some would say rodeo queen. Cheryl's quirky getup drew the attention of church members, as did her habit of staring at Ricky. Susan would confront Cheryl about that and tell her that, uh, you know, she needed to basically knock this off. Cheryl's reaction caught Susan off guard. Cheryl's response was like, oh no, God has meant for us to be together. So it was clear that Cheryl wasn't there because she was a member of the faith. It was clear that Cheryl was there because she wanted to be anywhere Rick was that she could be. Susan says the more she learned about Cheryl's fascination with Rick, the more concerned she got. Sue at one point went to Cheryl's apartment, and as they went by Cheryl's bedroom, Sue looked in and there was a shrine to Rick Roberts. We're not talking about a photograph on a nightstand. It's like a lot of pictures pasted, all these photographs of him and his derby car. Sue just sort of said, what is that? This is inappropriate, Cheryl, like Rick's married. Susan's account concerns investigators. Eager to learn more, they reach out to one of Ricky's closest confidants, his nephew, Eric. He tells them that his uncle first met Cheryl back in 2009 on one of their bi-weekly trips to Modesto. After taking the scrap load to the scrapyard, we would go to uh, Panda's Express and we would have lunch. We got to be friends with all the, the employees there. And so this lady named Cheryl was a supervisor. She and Rick were trying to get a sponsorship for Panda's Express for his derby car. And so we would get free lunches. Once, Cheryl approached Eric when Rick had stepped away. Cheryl came up to me one day and she gave me a little scrap paper with her name and number on it. She asked Eric to give it to his uncle. I was assuming that she was trying to hit on him. I went ahead and just, I ripped it up and threw it away. Soon after, Eric says he and Rick spotted Cheryl everywhere. Cheryl would go to his church, be at the same grocery store, same parking lot, and it was starting to get weird. Rick was starting to get a little nervous. He had told Cheryl he wanted her to stop following him. But Eric says that didn't work. And in 2010, Rick revealed another troubling development. Rick had shared with him that she had moved up here to Sonora to be closer to Rick and was working at McDonald's. He had told me that the girl was stalking me. She was kind of loony. You can see it in her eyes. However, Eric says Rick felt in the months before his murder that he had the situation under control. He hadn't had any communication with her for quite some time. 
he no longer had anything to do with her. When investigators check Rick's phone records, they confirm that he had not been in contact with Cheryl for some time. We didn't find anything related to Cheryl. Two years leading up to his death, there was just no contact. Faced with the fact that Cheryl may be yet another false lead, investigators turn to the only evidence they have, the 9mm shell casing. The shell casing from the crime scene was processed and the Department of Justice was able to narrow the type of firearm down to three different manufacturers. We knew that it was a 9mm. Detectives ran anyone that had uh, registered in their name those types of firearms. They noticed Cheryl Lucero's name. On March 12th, Investigators find Cheryl at her work, a Sonora fast food restaurant, and she agrees to come in for an interview the following day. She indicated that she really didn't know Rick Roberts uh, very well, that she hadn't spoken to him in three to four years. The detectives asked her on the day that Ricky was shot, what was she doing? She stated she was at work and that she clocked out at 10 a.m. in the morning and she went straight home. The witness said the gunshots were between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. Investigators ask her about the gun. They went on to ask her if she could give them the gun so they could go and check it out. She was cooperating. She tells them that, look, I'll bring the gun in tomorrow. But the next day passes with no sign of Cheryl. She told him she'd bring it in, but she never did. Three days later, investigators tried to track her down. The address that they had was listed on the paperwork for the um, gun. They talked to the landlord. The landlord tells the detectives she hasn't lived there for two years. So they couldn't find her at that given address. So then it's this whole cat mouse game. And so they have to keep tracking her back to work. It's like, hey, if you're innocent, why are you playing this? Coming up, a new narrative comes into play. But an even darker truth is exposed. She had created wedding invitations announcing her marriage. What you see is that she was obsessed with Ricky Roberts. between Rick Roberts and Cheryl Lucero ended years ago. Her gun purchase and behavior since his murder has made her suspect number one. She initially said that she was going to bring the gun. But time keeps going by and now she hasn't even showed up at all. The police go to her address. They find out she hasn't lived at that apartment in over two years. On March 18th, one month after Rick Roberts' murder, investigators finally track Cheryl down at the fast food restaurant where she works. She says she had moved and was now living at an address in Twain Heart. I believe it was November of 2012 that Cheryl moved in with us. I thought, well, she's trying to save money, so why don't we just rent her a room and then she can get rid of her apartment they once again told her they wanted her to come in for an interview. She indicated she was busy that day, but that she'd come in the next day and bring the firearm in so that they could compare it. Investigators leave Cheryl to finish her shift, but they don't take her at her word. Rather than wait for her to come in the next day, the detectives got a warrant and responded to the Twain Heart address she'd provided them that evening. Detectives are met by Cheryl, and later, Yvonne and Joe Iniguez. The sheriffs 
came to our home with a search warrant. They told us that they were investigating the murder of Rick Roberts and they wanted to search Cheryl's room. It was surreal and I couldn't believe it was going on in my home. An investigator combs through Cheryl's belongings. He doesn't locate Cheryl's gun, but he does find the next best thing. So he sort of opens his dresser drawer and he finds a test fire envelope that comes with your gun. When you purchase a gun, they give you a casing that was fired from your gun. Now he has that casing to compare it to the casing at the scene. Investigators take Cheryl back to the station. There, Cheryl claims she quit attending the same church as Rick over two years ago when Rick started hitting on her. I was leaving and he was getting ready to leave and he knocked me over to the side. He was precious. That's when I decided, you know what, this, I can't go to this church anymore. Did anything ever happen to me? No, no sexual whatsoever. Because I know Investigators steer the conversation to Cheryl's whereabouts on the day of the murder. She clocked out at 10 a.m. and she said she went straight home. The witness who heard the gunshots said the gunshots were between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. So they knew that Cheryl had time to clock out, drive over to Ricky's garage shoot him, and then leave. He left work within just a few minutes. And then Ricky's killed a okay. gun that's just like yours. That's all speculation. It's not speculation. There were two different ways she could have traveled from her place of work. It was approximately seven to eight minutes to rip shop. So we knew that she had the ability to make it there shortly after 10 o'clock. The detective continues to talk to her about the case. She's denying any involvement. There's, There's things no like way. this is something you just don't want to believe that happened. Something that you just can't take back. That's not what that is. Detectives don't let up. Hours into the interrogation, Cheryl suddenly changes her tune. How was it an accident? Tell me that. I guess I was just wondering. I just told him, I want you to leave me alone for good. I don't ever want to hear from you. I don't ever want to see you. I just went there to scare him. Um, is what she says. But the confession makes little sense to investigators. She hadn't seen or talked to Rick Roberts in years. And then she says that it was an accident and it accidentally fired not once, but twice. Either way, the statement is enough for an arrest. They say, okay, we're gonna arrest you. And she says, what do you mean you're gonna arrest me? At that point, Cheryl's story changes again. So that was all alive apart. She is now protecting another person. When asked who this other person was, she tells detectives it's Chris Tinkham, her former boyfriend. She claims Chris knew Rick hit on her in the past and wouldn't let it go. She gives him this gun and just wants him to go over and to scare Ricky. Chris Tinkham, this is going to rough Rick up and scare Rick. And then he came back and he killed Rick and she was, you know, surprised. Detectives inform her that she is still under arrest. So, I don't understand what you mean. You're under arrest right now. Yes, you're not being late. One day after Cheryl's arrest, Investigators set out to bring Chris Tinkham in. Chris is in shock and eager to clear his name. He has not been in a relationship with Cheryl Lucero for years. He also tells them that at the time of this shooting, he's at his place of employment. His boss, you know, verified that he'd been at work early. 
so there was absolutely no way that he could have been involved. After ruling out Chris Tinkham, they started to realize that Cheryl was just making up more lies. They need to focus more on her. The day after her arrest, authorities uncover a storage unit rented by Cheryl. One of the boxes that detectives found in the storage unit um, was filled with Rick memorabilia. Among the hundreds of photos, they make a particularly disturbing find. She had created wedding invitations announcing her marriage to Rick Roberts. What you see is that Cheryl Lucero was obsessed with Ricky Roberts. Coming up, yet another tale of obsession emerges. I discovered that Cheryl was involved with my husband, Joe. Will the truth finally come out? She pointed the gun and she told him, I never want to see you in my life again. together. 
I said, you're going to have to leave. I said, I'll give you time to find another place. I was trying to be reasonable, but she still hadn't moved out by June when the sheriff's department came and also interviewed Joe. Cheryl walks the jury through yet another version of events. The motive that Cheryl Lucero gives for Joe doing the killing is that he was jealous because she had told Joe about Ricky and that uh, he was upset and he used that gun and he himself killed Ricky Roberts. The story falls apart when Joe's wife, Yvonne, takes the stand. I knew he had nothing to do with it because he was home at the time of the murder. After a 15-day trial, the case goes to the jury. On September 4th, 2015, the jury came back with the verdict of guilty of first-degree murder and also guilty of the use of a firearm in a crime. Her sentence was 50 to life, 25 to life on the homicide, and 25 to life for use of the gun. Let her bathe in her mistakes. Let her live in her own misery. She is sitting where she's supposed to be sitting. With Cheryl behind bars, Rick's family is left to pick up the pieces. He was there for everybody. Whether you were, you know, in a dark place or doing your best, he was there for you. He was just a big, loving man, and his whole purpose was to put a smile on your face. We don't remember him as how he got murdered. He'll always be remembered as the Derby King.
the sun's the heat, hear the sun has come and I guess when I sat there looking out of the window, wonder if I could bring them down. I never knew that this would happen for way to get, but they just stop the feeling down. Set up the call up, we touch the morning images, and I feel it too. You know what was the fear, it has all the time, because when I sat there looking out of the window, wonder if I could bring them down. Fix my eyes and focus on It's the end that makes me pray That's the end of me pray I don't hear like another old girl I have only for so long That I no longer know You are my world Peace as I knew It is so much to me But guess when I sat there Looking out of the window Wonder if I could bring them down Oh, just then 